I was so excited to match to a state assignment, especially one in the heart of bluegrass country, where I drive past horse farms like these every day on my way to work. I knew a state assignment would give me the opportunity to explore a variety of public health topics. But what I did not know was that within months of arriving to my assignment, I would be leading one of the most unique, confusing, and challenging investigations the health department had ever seen. It was December, halfway through fall course, when I dis received a distressed call from my supervisor. He was calling to let me know that a physician was reporting three abscess-like reactions following vaccination. I could sense the worry in his voice. To put things in context, it was the middle of flu season, and there were a few other things going on in Kentucky around this time. We worked with the local health department and identified that these three individuals received their vaccines from the same business, Business A. We reached out to this business and their owner, let's call her Miss Smith, and asked them to cease all vaccination and set aside any remaining vaccine. By the end of the week, the local health department was on site. The local health department collected all remaining vaccine, but all that remained were six pre-drawn syringes. Now I do wanna clarify, when I say pre-drawn, I'm referring to the fact that someone has drawn up vaccine into a syringe from a multi-dose vial, much like the one you see here. And while use of a multi-dose vial is standard, vaccine should only be drawn up immediately before administration. So to collect vaccine that was already drawn up into syringes, this seemed highly unusual. We scheduled our visit to the business the following week. Unfortunately, we were not able to directly observe any vaccine handling or storage, as when we arrived on site, Ms. Smith let us know that she had contacted the CDC nearly one month earlier to report these reactions, and that when she contacted the CDC, they advised her to throw away everything. Vaccine, syringes, supplies, all of it. Thankfully, those calls are recorded, and interestingly enough, uh, no one tells her to discard vaccine, or anything for that matter. But maybe she was confused? Unable to directly observe the storage and handling, we asked Ms. Smith to walk us through her hand hygiene. Providing vaccines in a variety of settings, she reports that she doesn't always have access to sink or soap and water, so she has to use other methods. That makes sense. Ms. Smith proceeds to reach out to a nearby drawer and pull out two alcohol pads, much like the ones you see here. I looked on in disbelief as she proceeded to rip open the alcohol wipes and rub the two by twos across her hand. She said this is how she cleaned her hands most often. Lack of temperature monitoring, lack of thermostats or thermometers at all, Reporting of drawing up syringes of vaccine days to weeks before administration, and the use of a dormitory-style refrigerator with no backup power source, we had serious concerns on how effective this vaccine was. Our next logical question was to ask Ms. Smith about her background and training. She initially answers with nursing. It takes multiple follow-up questions to uncover that this background in nursing is no license, degree, or certification. No, it's far less. It's that she was trained by a nurse once, years ago, which now left everyone on our investigation team wondering, who exactly is allowed to vaccinate in the state of Kentucky? Business A is owned and operated by Ms. Smith. Ms. Smith's husband, let's call him Dr. Smith, has his own primary care clinic and reports having minimal involvement in Business A. However, all vaccine for Business A is ordered and administered under his medical license. Business A travels to different company work sites in their area and vaccinates employees at no cost to the employer, allowing these individuals to receive necessary vaccines without having to miss work. Ms. Smith reports that she is the only person who prepares and administers vaccines and that she alone traveled to seven companies between September and December of 2018 and vaccinated. We reached out to these companies. Six of the seven companies reported one location and that location was in Kentucky. I remember calling the seventh company and speaking with the HR manager. 
he let me know that they had 17 locations. I had to ask for clarification. Did he mean to say that Business A traveled and vaccinated at 17 of their locations? He answered affirmatively. Two in Indiana, 11 in Ohio, and four in Kentucky. And just like that, our investigation was now multi-state. Um, in talking with the companies, we also found out that there were three other individuals who would arrive on site and vaccinate employees, contradicting Ms. Smith's previous claims to be the one and only person who vaccinated. It should also be noted that around this time, we started to receive positive results. Individuals who were experiencing reactions and infections were seeking care, and their physicians and medical providers were testing their infections. These cultures were coming back positive for a bacteria, non-tuberculous mycobacterium, or mycobacterium fortuitum to be more specific. The significance behind this being that this bacteria tends to be found in water and has been associated with tap water in previous healthcare setting outbreaks. We had a few ideas on what might have been happening, but we didn't want to rush to any conclusions. We did, however, want to re-interview Ms. Smith, and we wanted to collect some environmental samples. So we were back at the clinic the following week. I want to take a pause here, because if you are confused, know that you are not alone. This was easily the most confusing part of the investigation for me. I had so many questions, and I went into this second visit wanting answers. Sure, call me naive, but up until this point, I was trying to give Ms. Smith the benefit of the doubt. For me, it was very personal. As a nurse practitioner, I've administered countless vaccines. I know its complexity, and I take it very seriously. I would be heartbroken to find out that patients of mine were getting sick after I had vaccinated them, and I would be devastated if a health department thought I was to blame. Sure, Ms. Smith was not a nurse like I was, that was clear, but she was trying to care for people, and I wanted to be wrong. Unfortunately, after this second visit, there was no going back. It was clear that these inconsistencies were more than just a coincidence, and two things made that very clear. First, when we arrived on site, we began a second interview. Because we knew the names of these three other vaccinators, I asked Ms. Smith who one of them was. Staring straight at me, she said she didn't know anyone by that name. Now before this interview, our investigation team had looked at Ms. Smith's public Facebook page, and the very person she just denied knowing was all over her account, in pictures and in posts. But even that would prove only to be the second most important thing we learned that day. Following the interview, we proceeded to prepare to collect samples around the clinic. Ms. Smith went back to her office and advised us to swab anything and everything. Our team moved from room to room, collecting samples from countertops, sinks, refrigerators, anywhere and everywhere Ms. Smith reported storing or handling vaccine. As we moved into the second room, something else caught our eye. Beyond an open doorway, in a dark side room, there was another refrigerator. But this one was different. Dorm style as well, but Ms. Smith had never mentioned it, and up until this point, we didn't even know it existed. I was hit with a wave of emotion. I was terrified, but also intrigued. What is this refrigerator, and what is inside of it? Should I go ask her, or should I just open it? <laughs> so I opened it. <laughs> Paralyzed by what I might have just found, I immediately shut the door. My chest was tight. I could barely catch my breath, and my fingertips, they felt like they were going numb. I was in shock at what I might have just seen. I had to open it again. I had to know if these boxes contained the very same vaccine that Ms. Smith had reported being supposedly told to discard. Sure enough, that's exactly what I found. Hepatitis A, hepatitis B, Tdap, pneumococcal, expired yellow fever, and various forms and amounts of sodium chloride. Now, I would like to say that I played it cool, and I knew exactly what to do next, but that'd be a big fat lie. I 
did not expect the visit to go like this, and I most certainly did not know how to handle this situation. So, I found an empty room in the back corner of the clinic. <laughs> I crouched down and huddled against the furthest wall, frantically swiped through my phone until I found my supervisor's number, and proceeded to convey my dilemma through whispers. My mind was moving a mile a minute. Was I even making sense? Apparently I was. I listened as my supervisor ran down the hallway to the health commissioner's office, phone in hand, and breathlessly explained the situation. I was asked to not only swab the newly discovered refrigerator, but collect all the vaccine. <laughs> After I gave myself a quick pep talk, as I'm sure all officers do on their first outbreak investigation, I confronted Ms. Smith. She was understandably stunned when I told her I had found vaccine. She ran to the refrigerator, claiming it was all expired and needed to be sent back to the manufacturer for credit. But it wasn't, and I told her that. Our concerns continued to grow as we began to receive results from those syringes that were collected at the beginning of the investigation. Two of the six syringes grew multiple organisms, and an additional two of the six syringes had antigen levels well below what would be expected in a vaccine dose. One of them was 50-fold less than the control. On top of that, a community provider reached out to the health department and let us know that he had seen five patients who reported receiving hepatitis A vaccines from Business A. In caring for these patients, he tested for immunity and reported that none of these five patients showed any signs of immunity to hepatitis A. This was enough. The Kentucky Department for Public Health issued a press release. Following this press release and a later interview with one of the additional vaccinators, we identified 23 companies with over 54 locations across all three states. We estimate that over 1,000 individuals received vaccines from Business A during the fall of 2018. We identified over 100 individuals who experienced one or more reactions following vaccinations from Business A. And we identified over 25 individuals who tested positive for Mycobacterium fortuitum, all with indistinguishable PFGE patterns, indicating one common source. Now, when I moved to Kentucky, I thought I knew what I was gonna be getting myself into. Hepatitis A, opioid overdose prevention, surely a foodborne outbreak, and maybe even try my hand at chronic diseases. But never in my wildest dreams did I think I'd be out swabbing a refrigerator and persuading a business over to turn over likely contaminated, definitely ineffective, and most certainly concealed vaccine. Ready to respond anywhere in the world at a moment's notice takes on a whole new meaning, and I couldn't be more grateful. Thank you.